And I'd just like to take uh, this opportunity on behalf of the five agencies involved in this uh, research report to thank Ben and Bill, who's here, and, and their team uh, for, for the tremendous amount of, of effort and energy they put into to this work. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to, to actually thank the five agencies. And I know we have here Richard Miller, uh, Matthew Carter from ActionAid and CAFOD. Uh, we have colleagues from Tier Fund, from Oxfam and from Christian Aid, who uh, were prepared to open up um, their staff, their partners uh, and, their, and their discussions to evaluate and really look at the realities of undertaking some of this work. And you will see from the report that it isn't all rosy. And, um, and we know that this is, you know, it's, it's not always the easy uh, picture of, of, of partnership that, that can be portrayed. And it's important to recognise that as agencies, this, there's, a, there's an ongoing discussion on, on, on also looking at some of the, the challenges that the report kind of poses to us. And I think Ben kind of voiced that here. Um, both Matthew and Richard will be joining us for the panel discussion uh, Q&A section to really also be able to respond on behalf of the agencies that, that led this research. And I think it's kind of key uh, that, that, they, that they do that. I'm going to now hand over to Paul, who's going to, to, to open <coughs> us up in terms of, of responding from uh, an ALNAP perspective. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and thank you, Ben and, and the team. I think it's... Uh, uh, for those of you who haven't read the report yet, I really thought encourage you to do so. I think it's a very, uh, very clear, very honest, very serious report. Um, serious because it, it <coughs> manages to go from the aspirational, which is a place where I think we often, we often sit in the humanitarian uh, arena, to the uh, to the implementation. You know, from aspiration to implementation, and. What I mean by that is it, it, it seriously engages with how things might look and what it would take to move from, from A to B or from A to C. It's a little bit like, and to compare small things with great, um, it reminded me a little bit of a sort of uh, home decoration project, you know, doing the, redoing the sitting room or whatever, the living room, and, and how, you know, you have the aspiration. You can sit around going, oh, wouldn't it be like it, nice if we had a window there? How about if the walls were pink, you know? But you've only really got to the implementation bit when you've you've gone out and you've got the paint and you've got the sledgehammers and and you know there's there's plastic on the floor you know that's that's the point at which you know that you've engaged with the thing enough that you actually mean to do something, and I had a feeling that this was a report that really meant to do something, um, and I'd like to, to to concentrate perhaps on some of the the challenges that some of the difficulties. That that might might throw up, not because not to say well, you know we shouldn't be doing it, but because I think actually in the difficulties and in the how you get around those things, that's where the learning is, and that's that's where a lot of the improvement comes. Um, so, and a lot of these thoughts I would say are, are by no means original. I was lucky to be at the, the World Conference on Humanitarian Studies, and and a lot of this ca actually came out from conversations around this report and some similar work uh, that were going on there last week. So I, I think this. The, this challenges us to think about, by thinking about who should be doing humanitarian response, I think it, it, it comes with a whole set of questions about how should we do humanitarian response, what should we be doing, when should we be doing it, and why would we be doing it in the first place. And so by sort of changing one of those variables to look at the, look at the who and to, to move from a sort of more implementation to a more facilitative role for, for international NGOs. I think you open up all of those other things as well. Um, ben mentioned, in terms of how would we do this, Ben mentioned a, a move from these bilateral sort of relationships, which is currently where we are, I think, in many ways around partnership, to a much more networked way of doing humanitarian action. And seen from from the point of view of, you know, if one were to go to, to Bangladesh or, or to Haiti and you take any individual southern NGO, they have many different relationships with many different actors. And so the reality is already sort of this rather confusing network of relationships, not just bilateral relationships, but lots of different organizations interacting. But somehow the the structure of the system has not caught up with that reality. So that one agency is going to be reporting seven or 17 different times to different northern, northern 
agencies. And so, so part of the change would be about how, if we meant to do this right. Part of it would be about the nature of the work we do, the, the what and the when. And again, this is just underlining what's already in the report. But um, the what, I think when, when we in ALNAP were doing our work <coughs> on southern NGO networks, we found that very few of those NGOs that we were interacting with there would describe themselves as humanitarian NGOs. You know, that's, that's not, it's not a, a category that necessarily makes sense. Um, and in fact, humanitarianism might not be kind of top of the list of priorities. It might, it's there, but it might be some way, some way down the list. And so uh, Ben was mentioning the, the, the shift to resilience. Um, generally, many of these agencies, many of ALNAP's southern, southern members, would put humanitarianism into a mix of a much larger portfolio of activities. So what does that mean if we are, particularly donantist humanitarian organizations, who wish to partner realistically with organizations like that? Another piece, of course, is the when do we do it? Because the, you know, sort of the 24 hours after an earthquake strikes is probably not the, the ideal time to be creating long-lasting and uh, relationships and partnerships. These, as Ben has pointed out and, and the team have pointed out, these are relationships which need to be consistent. They need, need to happen before response and continue after response and kind of really make us rethink the, the when-ness of, of, of when we as humanitarian actors work. Um, and then there's the why. And I think the report's really <laughs> honest and really interesting on, on the fact that some of the, so, and this is not true in all cases, of course, but we may have from, I mean, within organizations in the north, broadly, within organizations in the south, between organizations in the south, and particularly between organizations in the north and the south, differences about how we understand very important things like accountability, uh, like neutrality, like independence. And those are fairly <coughs> key, you know, they're fairly kind of in the DNA of what many of our organizations, both northern and southern, exist to do. But they, if they're seen differently, that creates a very difficult discussion, I think. And it's not just that looking at a southern organization, we might find that they see independence or accountability differently. It's also the fact of creating a relationship partnership with which is long long standing with a southern civil society organization means <coughs> that for the northern organization we can hardly pretend anymore not to be political you know if we're engaging in southern civil society over time in the long term and we were never really not political i think the northern organizations anyway but if we <coughs> if we're going to engage in these often very contested political spaces and we're going to choose to work with one civil society organization and not with another, we are making choices. And we can't pretend then that we're not making political choices. So I, I, I think the, the, the report does some really interesting things about, by challenging one thing, challenging these other areas of how this, the, the structure of human, the current humanitarian system is created. Um, I think there are two ways that you can go at that, I, you know, in terms of the implementation of it. I think one way is you can avoid those issues entirely. Um, you can do a kind of partnership, often unwittingly, often not, I'm not saying this is intentional, you can do a kind of partnership which is basically the recreation of northern organizations in the south. Yeah? Because the structure, the funding, Ben talked about the silos, all of these things, you know, in order to be able to report to, to donors or to, 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 uh, to the organizations they're working with, you can make organizations that look a lot like northern organizations and which are culturally acceptable. Or that's the easy way of doing it. Now whether you've actually then gained many of the, many of the, the, the virtues of partnership which, which the report is bringing out I think would be questionable. Or you can do the difficult thing which is both those northern and southern actors can come into some kind of relationship where they are prepared to support each other. Um, they are prepared to pay for, in many cases, each other, because I don't think we should just assume that the funding sits uh, sort of north of the equator either, although generally I would imagine the, the, the transfers would go that way. 
and they're prepared to put themselves on the line for each other, if that's what partnership means. You know, Southern organisations are prepared to do things which are politically difficult for them in their own context. Northern organisations are prepared to have conversations with their own base, which they find difficult, to come to a place which allows the, the, the principle, which, which respects the principles of both sets of organisations to happen. Um, I'm not sure, and this is where I might disagree with, with some of the findings of the report, I'm not sure that would make the sector better. Uh, I think it would make the sector different. I think it's a much bigger thing than just making improvements. I think it is actually about a fairly fundamental rethinking of the whole shape of the, how the whole thing looks. And in making it different, things would undoubtedly become better, and some things would undoubtedly be lost as well. And we'd have to kind of think about what are the things that we want to keep and what are the things that we're prepared to let go of. So to come back to the, uh, the <coughs> rather silly decorating an analogy, if I may, just to, to conclude, it feels to me this report a little bit like the point when you've got there, you've decided on purple, you've got the plastic on the floor, uh, you start to scratch away at the ten sheets of wallpaper that have been put there and you discover that it was only the wallpaper that was holding the wall together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, a very interesting uh, set of points and, and uh, challenges to, uh, to bring into the discussion, and I hope also that our participants here in the room and online will be preparing some of their kind of questions and uh, comments to, to follow up on this. Um, I think it's also fair to say that this uh, report is part of a longer research um, program and there is a, a, an area of work that, that, that is looking as well to kind of perhaps do some more of that decoration. Um, it, it's not the only <coughs> part of the, of, the, of the room decoration that's happening and, and maybe that will indeed um, be involved in building part of the wall back up, who knows. Um, but we can talk further about that in the discussions about the, the, the five agencies that will be hoping to do a much more comprehensive report as well.